Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we're pretty far into the year already uh, in terms of our program in the Intelligent Corporation Group. Uh, today we will be discussing zero knowledge enabled cooperative arrangements and we have Howard uh, and Zuko who's uh, I think about to join uh, um, here in the, uh, in the chat to do that today. So really, really excited about that. I think um, just to, uh, in terms of bringing people a little bit up to speed uh, on why we're talking about this topic, I will very briefly just share um, the chapter as a little bit of an intro to where we got to where we are today. And so uh, this is basically to thank all of you because um, between meetings, the chapter always changes tremendously. In fact, this time we have added uh, a variety of new projects and a variety of new meetings to discuss all of those, these projects. Um, so thank you all for you know really um, yeah commenting so uh, so um, so extensively on uh, on the book. I think it's it's really getting better every time. Um, and so you know we started this year with um, what what do we expect from this group from this book? Then we discussed what is voluntary cooperation? Why is it important? We discussed what does voluntary cooperation mean in default world? How is it our uh, how is it already the engine of our civilization? And then now we are kind of porting the whole cooperative arrangements that we discussed previously. So everything from properties to more complex rights to complex uh, co uh, contract arrangements. How can we port all of those into crypto commerce to make them more reliable, more accessible, um, but also ultimately how can we enable entirely novel arrangements based on that? And so previously, before this meeting, we had uh, three open society layers, and now we added two more, thanks to all of your comments. Maybe we add more, maybe we delete one again, but this is just to show you how much uh, it always changes. So basically, we'll start by unlocking new layers of the open society. The internet already unlocked a, a right to information inherent in technology. And uh, we are super excited to hear more from Chris Hibbert, Robert Hansen, all gnosis on idea futures and prediction markets very soon. Um, we have the second layer of, of the open society, monetary sovereignty, and many of you added uh, a variety of different current crypto and DeFi projects there. Uh, we have open society layer three, incorruptible institutions. Here we focus on property rights and how to do them better. Then a long, long, long section on better contracts and better arrangements there. Uh, we already had um, uh, Mark Stiegler join, uh, who has talked on video contracts. We will soon have Chip Morningstar join or just talk on Amex as the very first uh, split contract um, with Claros on decentralized arbitration. Uh, we already uh, had uh, Glenn Whale on quadratic funding. We will have Alex Tabarok on dominant assurance contracts. And then we also have a session on DAOs. So some of them are already scheduled. Some of them are not scheduled yet. So there's still a lot uh, to look forward to. Today, we're going to port it all into uh, the private layer. And basically, the Open Society Layer 5 is all about how can we take the previous four layers and privatize them gradually. So we discuss a few arrangements of how can we privatize the right to information, uh, how can we do privacy coins better, how can we create better private accountable institutions, and then finally, how can we create more complex arrangements uh, that have a privacy layer uh, as well, or an opt-in privacy layer. I think that's what Howard will also talk about. Um, and, uh, and, and then again, how can we uh, create novel arrangements here? So all of that is just to A, show you, please, please, please continue to add, comment, uh, uh, critique uh, the things that are already on there. And then uh, B, it's a really good segue into what we're discussing today, which is um, private uh, cooperative arrangement and especially those uh, enabled by our zero knowledge groups. So I'm super, super, super excited uh, to have two fantastic people there. I couldn't imagine to do it with anyone better than, uh, than, than Zuko and, uh, and Howard. Thank you. We're really flattered that you're joining. So without further ado. This is uh, supposed to be just the basics about Halo. Um, so we'll have plenty of time for the off the record conversation. But uh, you guys can jump in and ask for more of one thing or the other. Um, so let's see. the. Zero knowledge proofs were discovered in, I think, the 80s. Um, and then they weren't practical or uh, really actually implemented or used for anything until Zcash in 2016. And the zero knowledge proofs that we had at the time. Oh, and rewinding, I, I told you part of the story last time around, but real quick uh, when Satoshi and Hal Finney and the others were inventing Bitcoin, they talked about the privacy problem in Bitcoin, that it leaks information about everyone's actions to everyone else. Um, and they actually considered using zero knowledge proofs as the solution. Um, and at that time, when it's like probably 2010 or so, when they were talking about that, that zero knowledge proofs weren't efficient enough at all to fit into a blockchain. And then Zcash in 2016 was zero knowledge proofs, which technically it's the Groth 16 proof system. Well, it's the one we use now. Um, that one is 
efficient enough that the proofs are small, like a few hundred bytes, and the proving time and verifying time are fast enough that you can do it for every single transaction in a blockchain, and that's Zcash. But Cross 16 comes with um, one huge flaw or limitation, which is that there's a basically a backdoor uh, built into the math, which is that everyone uses a certain key, which is sort of a public key for verifying the correctness of proofs. And if someone knows the corresponding private key, they can forge proofs so they can convince you of anything arbitrarily. And so that's a huge critical fatal flaw in anything you would ever want to do with a zero knowledge proof system. And in particular in Zcash, that means, so the way Zcash is layered, there's an encryption layer for privacy, which just uses like normal old encryption. So the privacy is untouched by any issues in the zero knowledge proofs, right? The zero knowledge proofs are just for guaranteeing like scarcity and integrity of the monetary base. So the only thing that would go wrong if you had access to a backdoor that could forge zero knowledge proofs is you could uh, forge infinite Zcash. Um, although you couldn't violate anyone else's privacy. Um, so ever since then, we and others have been working and working on a way to make zero knowledge proofs that don't have that backdoor and are still efficient enough and practical enough. And uh, for years, I was asking my cryptographers, go ahead and come up with this thing, which is trustless and co has concrete efficiency parameters so we can fit it into actual things for engineering reasons. And while you're at it, make it recursive. So recursive is, all right, I'll skip to the third slide. Can you see the third slide? It's a Merkle tree. We'll come back to the second slide. So recursive just for zero knowledge proof just means you can prove that you ran a verification and the verification came out true. <laughs> so that's kind of a mind boggling thing, but you can imagine if the, uh, the L1, L2, L3 at the bottom here is a computation and you're proving, you can make a zero knowledge proof that you perform this computation and you got the right output. For example, it could be uh, a proof that I digitally signed some coins over to you um, and that they're valid coins and so on. But thanks to the zero knowledge part of zero knowledge proofs, it's not gonna reveal which coins or anything about my identity or anything about your identity or anything about the amount of coins. It's just going to prove that uh, some legit coins were legit transferred from, a to, from one person to another. So that's what we can already do without recursive zero knowledge proofs. We can just do that with normal zero knowledge proofs. But if you had the ability to prove that you ran the verifier, the zero knowledge verifier, and it returned true. Then you could build this Merkle tree of zero knowledge proofs. So you could prove that you verified two transactions and you could generate a proof that you ran the verifier on both of them. And then you could generate a proof that you ran the verifier on two super proofs and so forth. So does that make sense to everyone so far? Let me scroll around and see how many people are nodding. People are nodding along. Looks like everyone's nodding. Okay, tell me if anyone stops nodding, Allison. All right, so, um, so recursive zero knowledge proofs, basically, if they're efficient enough. Now, there was always sort of like theoretical, this always happens in cryptography where you can get an academic paper published in like crypto or whatever, but even though it's gonna take like literally a thousand years for the supercomputer to ever do it, to ever do it in practice. Um, but if you had practical, recursive, trustless zero knowledge proofs, then that would allow you to prove and verify arbitrarily complex and arbitrarily large truths. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Like I haven't yet figured out what people are gonna do this with. All I'm concentrating on, let's go back to slide two, Allison. All I'm concentrating on so far is number one, that's what Zcash is. And we're going to deploy Halo and Zcash as an upgrade. And then number two, uh, so number one is private money. Um, that was the first application of zero knowledge proofs that actually mattered as far as I know. And that was Zcash, like first version of Zcash. And then number two is scalable blockchains. You can see how it might be useful. And there's all kinds of 
interesting complications about how you like I can prove something to you in zero knowledge. I can prove an arbitrarily big thing. So I can give you a little block. We already have a prototype demo of this. I can give you like a, a 2000 byte proof. And here's the SHA-256 hash of the most recent Bitcoin block. And you can perform a cryptographic integrity check on this 2000 byte proof and the SHA-256 hash. And you can convince yourself that this must be the hash of a block that contains all valid Bitcoin transactions and which has a certain amount of proof of work on it. And recursively that I ran the zero knowledge verifier on the previous block as well. Um, and that that all lines up as well. So with this little 2000 byte proof in like 20 milliseconds of computation, you can convince yourself using recursion that this hash is the hash of the entire history of Bitcoin. So that's awesome, even if it's gigabytes and you never have to see the gigabytes. Um, so it's, there's some real interesting engineering architectural challenges left for how you can make scalable blockchains even given this, but that's the next thing on my list. Last time around, we heard from Howard Wu of Alio about private smart contracts. I don't really understand that part yet. And in general, I imagine that zero knowledge proofs, like recursive scalable zero knowledge proofs that are efficient and you know safe and practical might be useful for all kinds of other things. Here's the question, question, question for you guys to think about. Like, I, I think I can give you a 2000 bytes, which proves to you that there's a petabyte database of all the DNA of all humans and that, you know, like my DNA was one of them or I don't know. Um, so back to the uh, slide three. So you've got the concept of recursion, yes. Um, I want to try, I invited Sean Bo, the cryptographer who discovered Halo to join this meeting, but I, he's probably too hard at work on improving Halo to join. Um, I want to try to give you a little bit of the intuition for the breakthrough that Sean came up with, which is <laughs> how to get the recursion part, which was previously like impractical. Like it would, it would take like a hundred hours on a supercomputer or something to make one recursive zero knowledge proof. But Sean came up with a technique, which is that um, there is a, the verifier needs to do a computationally intensive evaluation of proof. And you can imagine like L1, L2, L3, or L4 are all different zero knowledge proofs of different facts. So what Sean came up with, which he called nested amortization was the terminology he used in the first paper. And some other scientists renamed it and sort of recontextualized it or, or, or presented a different light on the same concept. And they called it um, uh, accumulation schemes. So nowadays, it's most widely known as an accumulation scheme. And the idea is there's this really computationally difficult part that's going to take like 20 milliseconds of heavy computation. Um, to verify the correctness of the proof. And Sean came up with a way to accumulate, to cheaply take that part of two different proofs and merge it together into a new part that's just as big. So it's, it's very cheap on computation. So you don't have to spend all the heavyweight computation. So that's how when you build an arbitrarily deep Merkle tree, it's very cheap at each level. Um, to merge the two. You don't know that the two are true because you haven't done the heavy lifting of the verification yet. But then once you get to the root, then you can do one time the heavy lifting of the verification. It's been like 20 milliseconds. And now you know that all the proofs were correct. Um, so that's the, it's called, it's nowadays it's called accumulation schemes and it was invented by Sean Bo working at the electric coin company. Um, yeah, last slide. So here are the three like state-of-the-art zero knowledge proof systems today. Um, and on the top, I have the approximate costs, engineering costs for proving a relatively small thing. So an Orchard TX is a transaction in the forthcoming version of Zcash, which proves that out of a set of all notes ever, there could be like a million or a billion notes, which are um, at coins. You can prove one of those coins was yours, but you're not revealing which of the million or billion was yours. 
and that having demonstrated your control of the private key that is the unique controller of that coin, you're hereby transferring the coin to someone else's public key. So that's what I call a small proof. It's actually pretty big, uh, but it still fits under the, you, you can do it all in like a few seconds on like a modern laptop, uh, mobile phone even. And then the bottom layer is for a recursive proof, which is again, it's simply prove that I ran the entire verifier and did all the necessary verification, cryptographic verification steps, um, and that I got the output that the underlying recursive thing was valid. So uh, real quick, how much time have I already used? Can we just finish up this slide for like a few minutes? I think that's all I need. But you guys can ask questions about this stuff. Okay, Dean. Um, so real quick, I want to talk about these columns. It's pretty cool. The, the biggest single problem with GROSS-16, so the top row of both of those is GROSS-16, which was discovered by scientists in 2013, and um, it's the current standard in Zcash. And the main problem with it is the left-hand column is toxic waste. Um, that, that private key that you don't want anyone to have that allows someone to generate bad proofs that will pass the verifier, that's called the toxic waste. And that's marked in red because the best we could do so far is to have a multi-party computation where no one involved in the computation would be able to get a copy of the toxic waste. We generate the public key without anyone ever having access to the private key, um, which is pretty good, but, and it's what we did and it's worked so far for Zcash, um, but it leaves open the possibility that everyone involved in that initial ceremony colluded and kept a copy of the private key and then they would be able to forge. Um, so it's basically just not good enough, in my opinion. And the two new successor zero knowledge proof systems uh, both just don't have any mathematical conception of a, a backdoor or private key or toxic waste. Um, the next column is which cryptographic assumptions, which is a fun detail for cryptographers, but basically all three of those are fine. They're just different colors. <laughs> oh, it might be interesting to know that the middle one, uh, Starks, since their cryptographic assumption relies on just hash functions, then they're not vulnerable to quantum computers. Uh, but Halo, since it relies on discrete log, would be vulnerable to quantum computers. So that's a drawback. But discrete log is the most common crypto assumption. Like literally everything on the internet depends on it. It's like the gold standard of crypto. So I guess that's good enough for now. Is, the, is, there, um, a, is there a known quantum speed up for discrete log or is it just one of those where we suspect that there's a yeah, it's a known quantum. It's a known quantum speed up that can break uh, discrete law if you had a big enough quantum computer. So the, we're just relying on nobody having an effective quantum computer that can do like hundreds or whatever thousands of qubits. Make sense? Uh, if what's our window in the sense of uh, if nobody has that for a long time, once they have it, what does that do to the past? Oh, that's a great question. That's an excellent question. Um, yeah. Uh, right, so there's basically two things we do with cryptography. One is hiding information and the other is integrity or proof or whatever. And uh, the interesting thing is that hiding information, you're a hostage to time, right? You. Uh, if, if a quantum computer 100 years from now can break your encryption, then that might be terrible depending on what information is thus revealed. But if what you're relying on is integrity, then you can stop relying on that when the quantum computer comes along. And so proof systems are used for integrity, right? Um, I'm pretty sure, uh, I need to hesitate for just a second, but... Um, in, Z, in the current version of Zcash, with some interesting little caveats that we don't have time to get into, it's already the case that if quantum computers came along next year, they wouldn't be able to retroactively penetrate anyone's privacy. And we could then stop relying on the vulnerable proof system. And so we would then not be vulnerable to uh, forgeries by the quantum computer, right? Same with Halo. So, so just, just to make sure I understand, so the, the zero knowledge is not compromised, the proof is compromised. 
I I believe that's usually true. It gets complicated. Um, you could it it might be possible. So like if you're using public key encryption at the same time, like so you, like for Zcash for example, and probably for a lot of things, you need both information control like leakage control as well as proof, right? And I'm just hesitating. Yeah, so. I'm pretty sure that even with a completely effective quantum computer can do Schroeder's algorithm, it would not violate the zero knowledge or the confidentiality part of Halo or of Groth 16 and definitely not of Starks. But, yeah, but they could mint coins. What's that? But they could mint coins. Is the Right. So the idea is you stop accepting newly minted coins with this old proof system before quantum computers come out. Okay, just making sure that we are also moving along the slides. So uh, we because I think the quantum computing discussion, we are having another discussion just particularly uh, on uh, on the dangers of that at our June 25th gathering. For those who are really interested in talking about it, I do want to make sure we're cool. also getting into the off the record brainstorming part in case people have to jump at the hour. So I just want to do a time check. Okay. What's Move the time? On. Okay, good. Okay, so real quick, the rest of this is just for engineers. I, I, I'm an engineer, but it's pretty awesome that, oh no, back up. This is the last slide. Nope, nope. yeah, that one. It's pretty awesome that Halo is practical and effective. So it takes about two kilobytes for a proof or four kilobytes for recursive proof. And it takes only milliseconds to verify the correctness of a proof. And it takes only seconds to produce a new proof. Um, and that's something that we couldn't do with Stark. Starks existed before Halo, but they're, they're only good for, they're very heavyweight. So they're only good for proving large batches of things. We couldn't use them to prove every single transaction in Zcash. Blockchain. Uh, that's pretty much the end of my description of Halo. Oh, last fact is uh, the Zcash community is totally supportive of deploying Halo as an upgrade to Zcash. The first effect of that is just going to be to eliminate the possibility that someone has a backdoor key and can forge uh, Zcash that way. But then also in the future, it will be useful for scalability. <clears throat> and then maybe also all kinds of other stuff like upgrading Zcash to verify. Uh, you know, our arbitrary smart contracts by not by running it as a virtual machine and having consensus on the output, but by verifying that the following output must have been the output from running a correct smart contract, which is way, it seems way better. Um, other people are starting to use the same idea in other blockchains so far. I haven't yet seen it used anywhere outside of blockchains, but it's early. The end. Any questions? Probably lots of questions. Also, Sean just joined. Uh, so he was able to, I think, make time in case he wants to take a few of the more technical questions. Uh, I have one in terms of, you know, what's immediately next or is there anything that this group could do uh, to help you work along um, in particular on, on Halo 2? That's a good question. We would like to get more users of it. And I'm, I'm trying to do this uh, hack where Halo 2 the current implementation, which is a really high quality implementation by our team, is available under an open source license, but it is an open source license that not everyone will be willing to use. And so instead they can pay us or make some kind of a partnership with us in order to use it. So we'll see if that works. But it's currently already open source if you're willing to follow this particular open source license. Uh, and in addition, we're talking to a bunch of people about them using Halo in their thing. So either of those, use it under the open source license or contact us about using it for something that would be helpful. Okay, and then one final question from Chris Hibbert. So uh, Zuko, the last time you explained or at least gave an example of what proof might mean. And as I understood it, th it was an interactive proof. So I'm trying to figure out whether mm -hmm. the proofs that you're talking about here 
you, it sounds like you're saying that they're not interactive proofs, that, right. that somebody does a computation and that I can just look at the computation and uh, come to believe that they, yep. they, did, they did something akin to the interactive thing that, that we were talking about before. Yep, that's exactly right. It's called the Fiat Shamir transform. And it's exactly that idea. The ones I demonstrated last time were like a challenge response where you challenge a yep. hundred times in a row and then you're pretty sure they, you know, you have two to the minus 100 chance that they could have been bluffing the whole time or something like that. And that's the same concept in here, but we make it so that uh, the challenge is basically a hash of all of the things that you're proving. And so you have to satisfy that challenge at all of hundreds of points that are determined by the hash. And so therefore okay. you can't, uh, you can't cheat, you can't bluff effectively. There's there's strong reason to believe that you couldn't have uh, uh, faked the, the the inputs to the hash. So okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Thanks. So that really makes it all the more practical, right? You can you can just give someone like a two thousand byte packet, and uh, that's all they need to verify any arbitrarily complicated truth. I think this is like really a mind blowing. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing achievement. All right, lovely. Then maybe one last question from David. So in the in the smart contract setting, the assumption is that you need both the full contract, whatever it is that's being executed, plus the proof. So the proof, um, the, the the presumably the um, the contract itself doesn't need to be on chain. Is that is that the you mean like the source code? Like what is the right. computation that's being run? What is it that it's showing? Yeah. And, and the answer is me and you can make an agreement, have something that we both agree the there's a proof online. Nobody else needs to know what it was that was in the contract or anything else about it, but we can guarantee that it was secure and, and right. proper. And, and we can do state transitions, right? The, the shared consensus can say, okay, like, you know, we'll, we'll toggle this bit from A to B. Why? Because this bit said a certain smart contract has to like return true. And then we toggle this bit, right? But it doesn't need to know anything other than the identity of that smart contract. So if, if me and you have a, a smart contract saying that, um, you know, we make a bet that uh, quantum computers won't show up before whatever date, and it turns out that you win, um, then the smart contract was verified on the network, but um, there's supposed to be a transaction that occurs. I'm supposed to get money or you're supposed to get money because of right. that. Um, but the contract is not available to the blockchain. So I just don't understand where it is that the, how it is that you're enforcing that if you don't have access to the contract. Uh, I just. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the blockchain needs to know. So I'm going to come to it and say, I won the bet. Here's a proof, right? And the blockchain doesn't need to know doesn't need to have a copy of the source code. It just needs to have an identifier of the bet. Like earlier, you put up some state on the blockchain that said, here's a Zcash coin, and it will go to the first person who proves a true output of this identifier. So it doesn't need to know the source code of what goes into that identifier, but I, it has to prevent me from but you do have to showing back. that a different. Right. But you have to come back then it's the the contract doesn't kind of self execute you have to come back later and claim the money yeah the contract can be executed off chain i just have to prove that i ran this program and it produced a yes output all right and, and it has to be this program right so you i can't yeah trick it by substituting a different program so you have to have an identifier for which program we're talking about sure thanks um i guess one thing before before I start, I, I feel compelled to give another example, just one for, because someone had mentioned about a non-interactive one and one that I like to use off the shelf, which is, I, I will say it's a lot a lot less interesting than, than Zuko's example. It's certainly far, far less entertaining, but um, like if you think about the game of Where's Waldo, um, 
you know, there's, oh yeah, someone is actually mentioning it uh, in chat right now. So, so, so if you think about the game of Where's Waldo, imagine if you want to prove to another person that you know where Waldo is on the map, but you don't want to ruin the surprise for them of, of, you know, them finding Waldo, but, they, but you want to convince them that you know where it is. And, you know, this, this map actually has Waldo on it. Um, so that they're not just kind of, you know, wasting a bunch of time and like, you know, not finding him. And so one thing you could do is imagine like, you know, like a, an empty room, a perfectly empty room. And uh, there's a table and you lay the Where's Waldo map on the table and you invite the person into the room. Um, the person who, who, has, uh, who has found the solution. What you can do is take a giant sheet of white paper. This paper needs to be bigger than the map, far bigger than the map, and put it and lay it on top of it, covering the map. Then you can ask the person to basically cut a small hole uh, about the size of what, what Waldo would be on that map and basically shift the paper around and shift the paper around so that that hole will reveal Waldo on the map and then ask, the person and then and then like, like for example if i was the one who who wants to solve it later but i want to believe there's an answer then i can come into the room now look at uh, look at that white piece of paper see that there's a hole with waldo in it and believe that there actually is a solution but because the white paper is covering the map and the white paper is bigger than the map um, i won't know relatively on that map where waldo is and so that gives me uh, a non-interactive proof effectively that you know there really is an answer the answer is on this map and I don't know where on the map, you know, Waldo is, but, and, and, and I now know that this other person really did find Waldo. And so that's like a non-interactive way of kind of convincing someone and, and you know, the, to kind of leave it for permanent, so to speak, you could film the whole thing or, or basically like take a picture of that and like, and anyone can replay that and like watch it for themselves and, and believe that this really, you know, that you really know the answer. So like, that's like a human type of like zero knowledge proof uh, if it helps to illustrate um, um, like this example a bit more of, of this technology. Um, I guess like what I wanted to share were um, a few slides to like, there's, there's a giant leap of fast forwarding between like a human example and like a computer example. So, um, you know, just with those kind of principles or properties in mind, kind of think about these examples that I'm going to give uh, in the context of, of the human ones. But um, uh, let, me, let me share my screen here one second. While you're doing that, I want to say that Chris Herbert said in the chat that being able to prove that a thing is in a database without having a copy of the database would be hugely useful. I totally agree, and I think that's quite likely to uh, work. Yeah, I mean, even even the simple example of like for for actually for scaling blockchains, like like if you like are looking at like if you want to run a new node and like you know, your, your client has no state about a blockchain, you have to go and trust someone to give you some data, right? Like you need to sync up with other nodes. Like it's, as you know, it proves actually a phenomenal way to convince you from someone else when you're getting their data that like, hey, like I actually have real data um, and I'm not giving you like the wrong data. Like it's a, it's a nice way to, to demonstrate, like for example, one, you know, I have the longest chain um, here um, or, you know, two, like for a proof of work chain that like, you know, my, my blocks have a significant amount of work or real work effectively, um, however you want to define that criteria. So, so there's a number of reasons why that can be very valuable. Um, but anyways, let me just jump into this. Um, so, so for those of you who are familiar with blockchains and crypto, like generally decentralized applications have just become this new foundation um, for new paradigms. And there's all sorts of applications that you can think about from financial systems to digital gaming, um, governance, social networking, and data sharing. Um, you, you can kind of, there's, there's just this growing number of, of use cases for decentralized systems. Um, but with that, there's this current model comes with a lot of significant challenges. And, um, you know, for one, there is a scaling problem, which I think many are familiar with. Um, you know, this, the remarkable uh, power of this, of this technology comes with a cost. And fundamentally, it's that the computational integrity of these systems is really achieved by direct execution of state transitions. Um, and unfortunately, this, this has some costs. So, so for, the, for the first one, it would be that each miner has to re-execute every transaction um, along with its associated computation to verify the validity of it. And um, this, it, it creates a transaction throughput problem because users who send transactions containing large or even unbounded computations run the risk of stalling a system. And, 
um, currently to discourage these types of denial of service attacks. Um, you know, current ledgers use mechanisms like gas to economically bound that risk. Um, but the second issue is that these mechanisms fundamentally limit the expressivity and functionality of decentralized applications in that like by having to re-execute every transaction, um, users are basically competing with each other um, for compute cycles on like this global like like time shared machine basically. Um, and uh, it, it, it ends up creating this dilemma where you're basically provisioning, you're, you're forced to provision tiny execution environments um, that have limited runtime, um, minimal stack sizes, and just really restrictive instruction sets so that everyone gets some fair share, however you want to define it, of a time slice on the network. And, and, and that, that, that's frankly just not a great way to operate. Um, and, and so this is where you know, zero knowledge truths can actually take a very different direction and, and allow you to execute off chain um, and prove to the network that you actually computed something correctly and not have to force everyone to re-execute that computation. But the other side of this is, is um, with respect to um, um, privacy. And the bigger problem that I see is that, you know, by having to re-execute, um, this basically lets everyone see what's happening on the system. And that's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, for one, it reveals what program you're executing. It reveals what data you're giving the program and what the results are. And it also reveals, you know, who you are effectively. Um, and, you know, this is a huge, you know, th th there's, there's huge implications to this. Um, actually, recent work has shown that um, there is something called minor extractable value and this lack of privacy enables minor front running and arbitrage attacks. Um, basically by exploiting these inherent weaknesses of current ledgers, um, it allows miners to prioritize transaction um, ordering at their discretion. Um, and it, it allows them to effectively front run trades that are you know, opportunistically to their advantage. Um, but additionally, it also actually creates an issue of, of consensus instability. Um, and these consensus layer security risks pose systemic risks to, to ledgers um, as we know it today. And um, so, so to address some of these shortcomings, ZKPs, zero knowledge proofs, have received a lot of attention for their ability to achieve strong privacy, um, as well as um, you know helping to address these issues of scale um, by mainly providing integrity and, and good efficiency guarantees. And you know informally, you know these zero knowledge proofs basically allow one party, the prover, to um, attest to another party, the verifier, that some known computation was executed honestly. And uh, it was executed honestly for some private inputs. So, so for example, while Bitcoin requires users to broadcast their private payment details um, in the clear, um, zero knowledge proofs on a system like Zcash, for example, would enable users to broadcast encrypted transaction details um, by proving the validity of the payment without publicly disclosing the contents of the payment. And I think that that's effectively here what the big breakthrough in the technology is, is being able to achieve some level of privacy in a public domain. Um, and so and people were asking for, for some non-cash non examples. And at the least, like, I, I wanted to kind of shift the, the conversation a little bit in terms of looking at it in terms of the web, since every, I mean, we're using the web right now to communicate and more so like, especially in, uh, in emerging economies, um, you know, people are going mobile first, they're getting connected to the web. Like these are certainly folks that, um, you know, don't have the same legacy or lineage that, that we do in terms of the internet era um, of understanding some of the implications of you know what what the internet enables and also what it introduces as risk uh, risk factors and so um, the first thing I want to say is just, just that your knowledge actually makes web services more secure um, so if you think about the traditional model for how like even something as simple as an account is created today when you sign up for like a new account on some website what do you do you, you basically um, provide a password the password gets sent over to the server the server hashes it uh, realistically if they're if they're being compliant i know sometimes they don't even do that but if they if they are be, if they are doing the right thing they're salting peppering and hashing it and then they're storing that digest in a database and you know the next time you log in you do the same thing again you write your password they and you, you hash and digest it and you check that it matches what's been stored in the database and um you know, this has a lot of potential vectors for leakage, right? So uh, for one is, um, you know, there was a case actually just, I think two years ago where Google re realized that like something like a few hundred million users 
um, passwords were accidentally being um, uh, uh, printed out into a log uh, system that they had um, as part of a logging infrastructure that they had for, for a server. And that's like a huge problem because, well, you don't want to be logging people's passwords by accident. Um, but even more so that, you know, oftentimes a lot of service providers just simply don't do the right thing and they actually store your passwords on their databases um, whether explicitly or, or, or inexplicitly, it's, it's unclear, but um, you know, the risk is that with data breaches, um, that actually results in leaking your password. Um, there's also this other problem of, you know, sometimes people um, do the right thing of hashing, salting, peppering, but they don't choose good, good salts or, 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 or good peppers. And, and as part of that, you end up being able to use dictionary attacks to basically just guess what people's passwords are. And, and, and you know, the onus shouldn't be on on the server side to opaquely do this for you um, because they don't have the same incentive that the user does to protect that password. Um, you want to shift the incentive back to the user because the user is incentivized to actually you know, protect their own password. So like, what do you do instead? Well, with zero knowledge proofs, what you could actually do is in the browser, um, hash salt pepper your password client side and then send it to the server. Now, you're, you must be thinking, you know, well, how would the server know that, you know, you actually did that correctly and you're actually doing those steps? Well, that's where ZKPs come in. The zero knowledge proof can give you a legitimate proof that, hey, like I actually hashed this thing and salted it and peppered it using some data. And you can make certain checks to enforce, like for example, the salt's not zero um, or just kind of null um, and that the salt, you know, meets certain criteria, like there is maybe you know, some numbers, some, some uh, uppercase, lowercase letters, some symbols, uh, it's a, a length blah, a size blah. You can enforce all those things privately without leaking what the salt and pepper are in this case. And it gives you all sorts of added advantages for kind of in protecting, um, for, for protecting basically your own password. And, and that's something that I think um, people need to, you know, think about because as a web standard, I just think that going forward, this is something that we can actually easily push and make it the default. It's, it's a better way to authenticate effectively. And, and I realize it's a very low level and concrete example. So kind of taking it more abstractly, you can think about, you know, it, what if you want to build a, a, an identity system, you know, for authenticating, or if you want to do single sign-ons, um, this would be a far safer way because you don't want to be providing some other type of, you know, value that's going to be shared across different sites. Um, and, and instead you'd rather want something that mathematically gives you a guarantee of zero knowledge. Um, so so this, is, this is something that I think, you know, can be, uh, you know, fundamentally very powerful for, for, for setting a, a new type of web standard. Um, but, you know, more broadly, I think the second point is that just that this type of zero knowledge makes web services compliant. And so think about the case of like, you know, you're using a bank account or in this, in this particular slide, you know, you're, um, you want to buy or sell a stock. And, you know, typically for the average Joe, they will go to, through a brokerage who then routes it to the actual exchange. Um, and um, as part of that, you know, your brokerage firm is basically your middleman here. And, you know, middleman should already start to uh, incite kind of thoughts about, well, what if they man and middle attack you? And, and in this particular context, it's about, in, uh, it's about incentives. It's about, you know, you know potentially giving you an unfair price or basically front running you. And that's absolutely possible today. And it's pretty much just based on post factum audits that like we aren't, or like that, you know, and, and certainly good, good regulation, but that, that, that you aren't doing that. But nonetheless, these systems aren't very transparent. And so it's, it's hard to believe or, or know with certainty that this is indeed the case. And one of the things that Zero Knowledge Proofs lets you do is basically shield those types of orders that you're making um, from the brokerage firm um, and go straight to the exchange. And, and believe it or not, in this case, because of what Zero Knowledge Proofs enable, not only can you uh, make it such that the service provider is blind to the fact of what you're doing, but it actually allows for the brokerage firm to even have an, an auditable log of proofs that not only are you making legitimate orders, but that you're satisfying certain compliance requirements on their platform. So maybe you know on their platform, you need to be like a KYC individual and like, you know, with the identity example from earlier, maybe you provide that as part of this proof. Um, but, you know, maybe you also need to be, um, you know, an individual of certain net worth, or you need to be an individual that is no longer subject to certain, you know, uh, lockup terms uh, for certain types of shares. 
Um, you know, there, there's all sorts of trading windows that are commonly enforced in companies. These are all things that can actually be encapsulated as part of submitting that order now. Um, and, and I think that that's fundamentally a very unique type of, um, of compliance that isn't being used today. Um, and this is something that would be, you know, basically mathematically impossible to break, um, you know, other than like, like yeah, like, like unless you're 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 using the, the wrong type of software, but but in this case, like that's that's why the math is baked in, in a, at its core. And um, lastly, I want to make a point on on just that zero knowledge proofs really make web services fair. So taking that brokerage example, um, when you're trading, you know, it's and there was a case of this with with um, with um, I guess with Robinhood, which was actually masses, just not letting ever, anyone trade um, specific types of stocks like GameStop. Um, like that's that type of discriminatory action basically is something that is um, easily achieved today because everything is visible to the parties. But imagine if you actually had encrypted orders and you didn't reveal which stock it is you're trading, you know, the brokerage firm would only have at best random chance to guess what you're trading. And even more so that, you know, instead of uh, kind of thinking about it from a, from a fairness standpoint on the stock, you can also think about it from a fairness standpoint of the individual, um, you can't discriminate against any one individual in this particular case because the information isn't in the clear. And, and, and I think that that kind of gives you another window into thinking about how you can apply this type of technology because it it lets you basically actually treat everyone the same um, and you can algorithmically and, and programmatically demonstrate or prove to, to others that I am being fair with my with my software, with my service. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that should be called out. So. Um, yeah, like th those are all the slides that I had here, but um, uh, hopefully that helps to kind of give you some more thoughts, uh, food for fodder on, on how, how, how to think about this. And um, yeah, I, that was really all I had. So. <laughs>